Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. This week we are going to continue our series on oxygen uptake kinetics by taking a look at the VO2 slow component. Last week we talked exclusively about the kinetics of oxygen uptake during moderate intensity exercise, that is exercise performed below the lactate threshold. And where we got to was here. So we discussed the three phase VO2 response to exercise, starting with the cardiodynamic phase, phase one, the primary phase, phase two, which represents what's going on inside the muscle, and then the steady state, phase three. And then the intervening period, we have this component known as the oxygen deficit, which represents the anaerobic energy contribution to exercise. But this steady state is really very important. In fact, it's probably the most important concept in exercise physiology because so many things emanate from it. So some of the implications of steady state behavior include first and foremost, the fact that the relationship between power output and running speed and oxygen uptake and indeed heart rate is linear. And I can show that here with this plot of moderate intensity exercise responses. I've assumed the kinetics are the same in each case and all I've done is increase the work rate. So here we have 150 watts, 200 watts, 250 watts and 300 watts. How do I know how big those increments are? Well there's a nice relationship between VO2 and uh, power output. So for every one watt increase in power output you would expect to see an approximately 10 milliliter per minute increase in VO2. And so it linearly increases with work rate. We can use that linearity to extrapolate as well. So we can take the VO2 data and the oxygen deficit and we can predict what would happen if we were exercising above the VO2 max. And this is the basis of the maximal accumulated oxygen deficit test and the estimation of anaerobic capacity. We can also assume steady states in VO2 and VCO2 and from that we can calculate substrate utilization by using the respiratory exchange ratio VCO2 divided by VO2. We ignore or usually ignore protein metabolism um, because in the fed state it's a negligible proportion of the uh, substrate use. And most recently We've got used to using power measuring devices. They've become more affordable, as have GPS watches and smart watches. And essentially what these can do, or these claim to do, is measure the number of calories that you've used during any exercise session. And they can do that because of the VO2 power output or speed linearity. So you can see power output increases and VO2 increases in a linear fashion. So all you need to know is the power output. You can then work out what the oxygen uptake would be. And from the oxygen uptake, you can then calculate the calorie expenditure because oxygen uptake is an indirect measure of energy expenditure. And that's why linearity is so important. Everything from setting training zones through to uh, calculating calorie expenditure and everything in between. There's just one problem though. The linearity and steady state behavior does not hold above the lactate threshold. So for higher intensities of exercise, in other words, all the intensities of exercise that are particularly interesting to us, uh, above 50 to 60% of VO2 max, this linearity does not hold. And we've known that this linearity doesn't hold for the better part of 60 years and arguably even longer than that. Probably the first real illustration that there was a problem with this notion of a steady state during all intensities of exercise comes from Ustrand and Saltine in 1961. Now they were doing this experiment to try and measure the plateau in VO2 during exercise and they found that but cast your eye over the lowest intensity of exercise which is performed at in what is in new money 270 watts and you can see that you'd expect a steady state to occur after three minutes and it doesn't. VO2 continues to slowly rise by almost half a litre a minute by the end of the exercise. So clearly something's going on there that shouldn't be. In 1972, Whip and Wasserman performed probably the seminal study on this where they actually looked at various different exercise intensities and looked at the VO2 response 
uh, and Whip and Mahler in 1980 summarized this and you can see steady states for this participant at 50 watts, 100 watts and 150 watts. This is a particularly fit participant but at 200 watts there is a delayed attainment of a steady state. Even more delayed at 250, arguably no steady state whatsoever at 300, 350 and 400. Something is changing compared to what happens during moderate intensity exercise and within the field there was a real scramble to work out what that was and what it all meant. So let's just have a look at a typical oxygen uptake response to heavy intensity exercise. Now what could be happening here? Well there's two possibilities. Either the moderate intensity kinetics are being distorted in some way. So we have the, essentially the same processes but they're just changing in character. Or there are more components to the VO2 response than we thought there were. How do we get around this problem? Well we can do some curve fitting. So what I'm going to do first of all is fit a curve assuming that we've just distorted the moderate intensity exercise response. Now all you need for moderate intensity exercise is a mono exponential function that we looked at last week. So let's fit that. And when you do that, well you look at it and it's it's not great but it's not terrible either. Uh, one thing you should notice is the time constant of the response is rather long, nearly 70 seconds. Typically you'd expect a primary time constant, which is what you're interested in, to be somewhere between 25 and 35 seconds in a healthy participant, of which this is one. The other thing you'll notice is that the curve starts before the exercise does. And that, frankly, is not physiological. That's just because the curve doesn't fit the data very well. And you could see that if you were to plot the residuals, they'd be non-white. So there'd be very large deviations here and here and also towards the end as well. So this curve, whilst it broadly characterizes the response, does not fit it very well. And in the early 1990s, two groups looked at this in detail, uh, Patterson and Whip in the Journal of Physiology and Barstow and Malay in the Journal of Applied Physiology. And they essentially came to exactly the same conclusion, but using slightly different methods. What Patterson and Whip did was say, well, OK, if there is an extra component, if we only fit to three minutes up to 180 seconds, then we should see something emerge from that curve if it's a separate component. And so that's what they did. And that's exactly what they found. So here you see the time constant now has been shortened considerably. Remember, these are the same data. So we've actually got a 30 second reduction in the value of the supposedly primary time constant. The curve now does start after exercise does. So that's a plus. And you can see that the VO2 response carries on rising above the anticipated steady state value. That's extremely important because it shows the slow component is not making up for a shortfall in VO2. It is rising above and beyond where you'd expect it to. And that is very important. Barstow and Malay looked at this in a different way. And they said, well, if there is a second component, let's fit a second curve to it and see what happens. And they did it in two ways. They either started both curves at the onset of exercise or they started the second curve with a delay. And they found that consistently fitting with a delay was the better fit. And this is the kind of thing they looked at. So here you see the first or the primary phase or the phase two fit. And then you see the phase three or the slow component fit. And you can see quite clearly there's a delayed increase in VO2, which starts with a delay. The primary time constant now is a very reasonable 30 seconds. And so you might say, well, that's that's a done deal. And largely it was. Both groups concluded essentially the same thing using slightly different methods. Now the problem with this method is that the parameter estimates from the slow component curve can sometimes uh, be a little bit problematic. So for example the time constant in this particular curve was 169 seconds, so very slow, but its 95% confidence limits include zero. So very, very wide confidence limits. And that's what you typically see with this kind of thing. So there are two schools of thought as to what you do with this. Either you fit a curve to it or you isolate the primary phase and fit that. And you can do that statistically uh, by looking at chi squared and, and uh, the actual value of the time constant and its trend. And that's the, the approach I generally take as well. And so to summarize this, 
Here we see a, a particularly fit participant doing heavy exercise, uh, pedaling at about 300 watts. And this person was a particularly clean breather. So you can see a very prominent cardiodynamic component at the onset of exercise. There you have your primary component leading to the primary amplitude. The primary kinetics telling us about what's going on in the muscle. And then we see a delayed but elevated uh, increase or delayed increase in VO2 which we call the VO2 slow component. The slow component itself can usually and is usually characterized by its amplitude, how much the VO2 rises in this phase. Now you can also of course do this in a, a slightly simpler way of looking at the VO2 at one time point and the VO2 at another time point. If it's changing there's a slow component there. So in the literature you often see VO2 6 minus 3 in other words, they take the six minute value, subtract the three minute value from it, and that gives you your slow component amplitude. That's very rarely done these days because we typically rely on modeling and then calculation from there. The other factor that you need to take into account with a slow component is its trajectory. So it's not just how much it rises, but also how fast it rises can tell you about the sustainability of exercise. Where's this slow component coming from? Well, in the early 1990s, uh, David Paul and his group uh, working in Peter Wagner's lab did an experiment where they simultaneously measured pulmonary VO2 and leg VO2. And it's called twice one leg because they only catheterized one leg and then they just took the VO2 that they measured and doubled it. And that kind of made sense because everybody in their sample had two legs. And this is for moderate exercise in panel A and for heavy exercise in panel B. And you can see a close correspondence between pulmonary and leg VO2 in both cases. But the rise in pulmonary VO2 was also tracked by the rise in leg VO2. And what Paul and et al calculated was about 86% of the slow component they measured could be accounted for by the VO2 of the exercising leg. Much of the remainder comes from respiratory muscle work and cardiac work. So what's actually causing this? Well, that's still uh, the source of quite a lot of debate. But one of the pivotal studies was done by Barstow et al. in 1996, when Andy Jones was working in his lab. And what they showed was that the amplitude of both the slow component and the primary component was sensitive to the fiber type characteristics of the participants producing the response. In other words, somebody with a large number of type 1 fibers would have a relatively small slow component and a relatively large primary component. And the opposite was true with those individuals with a predominance of fast switch fibers. So here's somebody who's only, who's only got 18% type 1 fibers, so a very fast switch dominated individual. And you can see a very much larger slow component. And these were data that were corroborated later uh, in more detail by Pringle et al. Um, if memory serves me correctly, that was in 2003. But what does that actually mean? Well, it means something to do with muscle fiber type is driving this slow component. And there are really two camps you can kind of get into it. It may well be that there's a con contribution from both. The first is that perhaps you recruit type 1 fibers and then as exercise progresses, you have to recruit um, some type 2 fibers or some extra fibers to keep the exercise going. So motor unit recruitment and increased motor unit recruitment is one reason why you might get an increase in VO2. A second reason you might get an increase in VO2 is that there's something going on inside each muscle cell itself that's making the exercise more efficient. So proton leaks and changes of that nature, different substrate utilization as exercise progresses may cause an increase in VO2. This is still an active area of research, but it seems to be something going on inside the muscle that explains all of this. The VO2 slow component, I would argue, is one of the most important issues in exercise physiology because it does so much to characterize what we see. So for moderate intensity exercise, we see no slow component at all and we see the attainment of a steady state uh, below the lactate threshold. For heavy intensity exercise, this is where the slow component emerges. And you might say, well, there isn't a heavy exercise bout there, but there is because this bout in the uh, black uh, circles is actually performed 15 watts below the critical power and so the VO2 response by right should actually 
uh, reaches steady state just below this dotted line. It doesn't. It carries on rising before it then reaches a delayed but elevated steady state. And then if we go into the severe domain, the VO2 slow component never stabilizes. It carries on rising until VO2 max is attained and then shortly thereafter the participant reaches task failure. And for a higher exercise intensity, a higher power output in the severe domain, that process happens more quickly. So now you see the key parameter to measure with the slow component is not its amplitude but its trajectory, how fast it's rising because it's going to be constrained by the VO2 max. And so the slow component, what have we learnt about it? Well first of all that it even exists and this was a source of debate until actually I came onto the scene in, and it's not that I made it exist or anything it's just that uh, Brian Whip was particularly exasperated in the late 1990s because there were still scientists claiming that the, the VO2 slow component was an artifact but I can promise you it really does exist. It also needs to be handled with great care when you're modeling your data. You do not want the slow component to contaminate your estimate of the primary component. So in your modeling process if you're going to try and model heavy or severe intensity exercise data you have to know where your slow component starts and you have to model accordingly. Otherwise, your primary component time constant will not be accurate. The slow component itself has major implications for the interpretation of exercise response, metabolism and respiratory control, and we're still not entirely sure how it does what it does. It also influences fuel use during prolonged heavy exercise and it does that by increasing the oxygen cost of any heavy intensity bout and the more it increases that oxygen cost the faster you will draw down your energy reserves and so it's not surprising there's a strong correlation between where the heavy domain is in a participant and their potential marathon performance because it's obviously heavily dependent upon uh, muscle glycogen stores and finally and perhaps most importantly the slow component shapes the power duration relationship itself and you can see that in terms of the attainment of VO2 max and then task failure and then you get this hyperbolic relationship between uh, power output and time to task failure and that is directly related to the behavior of the VO2 response. All it remains for me to say is thank you very very much for listening to me and I will catch you next time. Goodbye.